fulfillment. Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. Now, I want to uh, recognize a few of you. I know that uh, some of you have already received quite the accolades. I went to awards today, uh, and this awards, I promise you, will not be that long. Um, this is the your Moewib Tib Awards. It's a Japanese word. Actually, it's not. It's an acrostic that stands for You Remind Me of Who I Always Wanted to Be Awards. Now, there are three of you who reminded me of somebody I always wanted to be. They're not based on academics. I was not that academically high in my class, so if you're smart, way to go, whatever, good for you. Uh, there's a lot of stories, old stories, about my accomplishments in high school that were nothing short of heroic. Uh, some have become legendary. In fact, they're just none of them that are verifiable. There is the weight room story about me. I was amazingly blessed with strong legs, so in the weight room one day, all the guys decided to see what I could press, and so we put all the 45-pound plates we could find in the weight room on it. I easily pressed that up, and so we got the biggest guy in our class to sit on top of the weight press, and he sat up there with all the weights, and I pressed him up. I have, if I had to guess, the estimated weight would be somewhere around 2,000 pounds, which is an incredible feat, since I weighed about 135. No one actually remembers the exact weight because it's not exactly verifiable. There's another story about me that I never made a B in high school. That story lasted a long time until my kids went to their grandmother's house and actually found my report cards, and that story kind of came apart. What I'm trying to say is that the more older I get, the more I realize my accomplishments have been embellished. In other words, they have gotten bigger and more exaggerated, and so now I am beginning to accept with counseling that I have never really accomplished anything. All my goals and dreams were left unreached in high school, but today some of you have inspired me because I have vicariously lived through you and you accomplished what I was wanting to do to begin with. The first award, and I got three of them, and I, I want you to come and get it, actually. I, I got you something. It's called the Beast Mode Award. Um, I always wanted to have that extra Beast Mode gear. I kind of thought in my mind I had it, but I never really had that. I wanted to be able to reach some sort of untouchable level. I wanted to be the best there was at something, sports, smarts, music, whatever. It didn't really matter. Just the best, like nobody else could. Of course, my mom told me, you know, son, there's always going to be somebody better than you, which is a lie you do realize there is somebody that is the best. You just don't know where they are. So, there is someone in among us that is the best, period. It's the person that everyone else wants to be. They are the beast. They went into beast mode and beat everybody else. This year's beast mode goes to Kirsa Morris. Now, hang on. I have for you an official Affinity War Hulk because Dr. Banner has an extra mode and it's a beast mode. So congratulations, Tirsa. If you want to throw a long, sharp object, the best you'll ever come is in second place because she won state in first place. How far? 107 feet? 102. I can't hit a golf ball that far. It's really good. It's really good. Beast Mode, congratulations. Second award is the I Pulled Off What You Could Never Do Award. In high school, jumping was my thing. I used to make first graders sit in a line to see how many I could jump over them without hitting the last one. 
And I maintain this story without exaggeration. I have key witnesses that in the ninth grade, I dunked the basketball in PE. So my goal always became to dunk in a game. The opportunity came my senior year, last game, Geraldine. Two on one breakaway. The point guard had the ball. I'd already dunked it in warm ups. And so I'm on the right wing coming down, and I make eye contact with him, and I look up to let him know, just let it fly, and I got it. I leaped into the air well above the rim, and I looked down, and he gave me a bounce pass. And the ball went between my legs out of bounds. It did eventually happen in a pickup game in Rainsville Park on a nine foot goal, but that doesn't really matter. So the award for I pulled off what you could never do, Joy, goes to Trevor Gentry. <laughs> this goes in your trailer at Auburn. Awesome. I did dunk on my mom one time, and she <laughs> I better not she's got that. game. So it's, <laughs> congratulations. All right, last award. This is the highest award that anyone could ever achieve academically or anything otherwise. It is the I did what everyone else only dreams of award. If you've ever watched the movie Walter Mitty, it's that award where he runs into a burning building only to save a three-legged dog and on the way down shape a prosthetic hip so the dog can walk on four legs. He did what nobody else could do. Anybody could just dream about. As children, we've all dreamed of being that individual when faced with absolutely impossible odds, somehow miraculously steps up and destroys whoever or whatever they are faced with. The daydream that places you in front of thousands of people and somehow you get put in the spotlight to do the thing that nobody else thinks you can do. You probably had something similar. If you don't, please don't tell me. It will make me think I'm weird. It's like being at a rock concert where the lead guitarist stumbles on stage and goes down, and so they ask if there's anybody in the crowd that could take the role of playing lead guitarist, and you shyly lift up your hand, and they bring you on stage, and everybody's laughing at you until you pick up the guitar and absolutely rip it in half, and all of a sudden the whole crowd's just chanting your name. It's that award. Everybody goes from laughing to cheering. It's that moment that happened actually in this class this year you look at this individual and you say, there's no way. He couldn't do it. It's just not in him. But faced, when faced with insurmountable odds, thousands of people looking on, this individual rose to the occasion and absolutely crushed a much better, more equipped opponent. Absolutely putting them to shame and forever going down is the man who did what everyone else can only dream about. This award goes to Wyatt Lee. Wait. Who fiercely stood up in front of thousands and faced a fierce opponent who could dance circles around him. <laughs> Yet, somehow, he reached deep down and destroyed his opponent with thousands cheering on. Wyatt. <clears throat> Wyatt, for you, I have, it goes on the dash of your car, it's a bobble hula doll dancer. Now, this is what I want you to do. Every time you see this little girl shake on your dash, go, oh, no, don't even. I'll crush you again. <laughs> now, hang on. I want to have a little fun. I asked if I could do this. I noticed something when looking through the annual at you guys. And by the way, y'all used to be ugly, but y'all are not now. It's really cool. <laughs> I looked at your 10th grade annual, and I noticed this guy didn't have a beard in the 10th grade. But then he gets shot. And he comes back in the 11th grade, and he's got a full beard. So I'm thinking, something happened, and if you get shot and live, you get a man card. <laughs> and you grow a full beard. <laughs> so for my 410 buddy, who wasted one shell on himself, I got him a box of shells. Fun's over. But dude, congratulations. I daydream about all that stuff when I was a kid, and y'all actually pulled it off, and I never could, so way to go. 
I want to talk to you about the year 2050. The reason I picked the year 2050 is because in the year 2050, you're going to be about my age. You're going to be a middle-aged bald guy. And the world you're going to live in is extraordinarily different than the world you're living in now. There's two things that are happening, and you've already noticed them taking place, that are radically dividing the world that you live in. Politics and religion, the two things that people tell you not to talk about, everybody is running to their favorite place to go, wherever that is, and it's dividing our country in half, it's dividing our world in half, and when you get my age, you will have to make decisions about whether or not it's safe to go to an Alabama football game or safe to go to the mall because our world is learning to hate each other overnight because we're being divided by those two things. Now, I don't know anything about politics. I'm very apolitical. I really don't care about that. If it offends you, I'm sorry. But I do know something about God because I did experience something radical my senior year at Auburn University. And so I want to share with you just a little while about that. But let's start about the idea of God. In 2050... When you're about my age, Muslims will have grown the fastest than any other religion, and worldwide, Muslims and Christians will be equal in number, 50-50. Hindus will have grown. Jews will grow. Buddhists, oddly enough, will remain the same. India, which is one of the most populated places on the planet who's full Hindu, will have the largest population of Muslims in the world when you're my age. Today, three-fourths of Americans profess Christ. I said profess, I didn't say born again. But when you're my age, two-thirds will. And if you want to live in the country that's predominantly Christian, you'll have to move to Africa, because by the year 2050, Africa will be the most densely populated Christian population. Oddly enough, this is fascinating, atheists who don't believe in God and agnostics who don't want anything to do with God will decline. Now the reason that's so amazing to me is I feel like everybody I meet is either an atheist or an agnostic. In fact, science tells us right now, you guys, that the smarter we become, the less we need God and therefore atheism and agnosticism will grow. But actually the opposite is going to happen. The smarter you become, the more you're going to divide and go to a religion. Why is that? Here's why. And I'm going to talk to you about three things. I'm going to talk to you about God. I'm going to talk to you about you. And I'm going to talk to you about Christ. Why in the world, the smarter would we become, would we less likely become atheists and agnostics who don't care anything about church, who don't care anything about religion? And the reason is because God did something when he made you and he put the very idea of God in every man's heart. This is what he says in Romans 1. That which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Since the very creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. The reason the Easter Bunny doesn't bother you, sorry if your kids are here, that idea is not in your heart. The reason you'll never get away from the idea of God is because He fashioned you that way and it's in your heart whatever you think about Him. Now, the reason is primarily because of creation. When we walk outside and we see the diversity, the beauty, and yet the continuity of everything, we're not fools. We know a bang didn't happen one day and through sheer randomness, here we sit today with all of our uniqueness. That's absurd. In fact, somebody was a really good mathematician. I don't know if they're here tonight, but you can't calculate the probability of that happening. It's not possible. So through creation itself, God put the idea of Him in every man's heart in fact, the Bible begins with creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
The Bible ends with creation in Revelations 14. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth. In the middle in Hebrews 11, it says, By faith we understand that God prepared the world. And there's 59 other verses in Scripture that God says, I created the heavens and the earth. And yet, science says, no you didn't. Now here's the problem, though, with the idea of God. Man took this idea in his heart and he tried to create a God after his own image. And that's why we have all these other religions. If you want to know where they all come from, everybody's got the idea they just wanted to build their own God. Romans 121, the verse right after this says, For even though they knew God, they exchanged the glory of God for an image in the form of man, birds, or animals. Hindus worship cows. They created their God in the form of a cow. And I've been there and I've seen that in Myanmar. Buddhists worship this bizarre lady with eight arms. Her name is Durga. Hindus also worship a man. He's a blue guy with four arms. I don't understand the multi-appendage thing for creating your own God, but all the foreign gods have more than one arms. In fact, if you want to worship Durga, and I saw them do this too, you worship Durga through yoga. She's a lady that sits on a tiger with eight arms and you worship her by exercising. It's very bizarre. That's what they did with the idea of God. Now, God did something extraordinary for us, though. He chose one people group on the planet, the Israelites, to self-reveal himself. He said, you're not getting close, so I'm going to show you exactly what I'm like. And so this is what God said. The Lord God says, I am compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, forgive iniquity, transgressions and sins, and yet he adds this, I will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He says in another place in Leviticus, he says, speak to the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So if you want to know about the idea of your heart and what he's like, he's compassionate, he's gracious, He's slow to anger. He abounds in love and truth. He forgives sins, yet he leaves this hanging that causes fear in our hearts. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. And he is holy. Which brings us to the second person, man. God created man, and if you remember that verse I just read to you, he said to man, you shall be holy because I am holy. In other words, God created man to be his image bearer. We were supposed to bear the very image of God. That's what he said in the garden in Genesis 127. God created man in his own image and in the image of God he created him male and female who created them. And that's why I thank God for every one of you because every one of you, boy or girl, were created in the image of God. There's something about you extraordinary beyond anything else in all of creation. Now, the only way, though, that you were going to actually do what God created you to do and bear His image was for you to be 100% obedient and 100% dependent. But that didn't happen, did it? In Genesis chapter 3, you know very well what took place. Adam plunged all men into condemnation. Now, let me tell you something about Adam. There's two men that God personally came to be or created. Adam was the first that a man and a woman was not involved. God simply created Adam. You know what Adam did? He failed to be 100% obedient and 100% dependent and therefore he plunged all of us, the Bible says. People don't like these passages, but I'll just read them to you and let you argue with God about this. Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 5.18 So then as through one transgression of Adam, there resulted in condemnation to all men. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 You were dead in your trespasses and sin. Among them we too all formerly lived 
in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind that were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That's what Adam got us into. He was called, he was made to bear the image of God, and he rejected that because he wanted to be his own God. And so he disobeyed God, and he didn't erase the image, he effaced the image. Have y'all ever dropped a mirror, and it actually stayed in the frame, but it shattered? And you pick that up, and you try to look at your face, and there's an eye here, and there's a nose here, and there's an ear over here. That's what we did to the image of God when we fail with Adam. We cannot bear that image anymore. It was crashed. It was effaced. It was broken. Now, if you don't like Adam being your representative and condemning you by what he did, I'll let you condemn yourself. This is what James 2 says. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty. Remember what God does with the guilty. He does not leave them unpunished. Let me ask you three, three questions. I really want you to answer them. Any of y'all ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Like they didn't. Okay. So what do you call a person that tells a lie? A liar. You ever stole anything? I mean, like, okay, I need a pencil for class. There happens to be one on that desk. Raise your hand if you ever stole anything. Really, guys? What do you call somebody that steals something? A thief. Have you ever looked at a person of the opposite sex and thought, dog gone. That's crazy. Jesus says if you've done that, you've committed adultery in your heart. Anybody ever done that? Raise your hand. Looked at the member of the opposite sex and went, oh, I got lust in my heart. Jacob, you don't have to participate. I appreciate you raising your hand. (laughs) Okay, so by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, adulterer. And if you were to stand before God, would he find you innocent or guilty? What do you think? I want to hear you say it. It's so funny. He said this to a guy one time, and he said, but I'm a good man. I was like, okay, okay, whatever. You're the one that just told me you're a lying, thieving adulterer. But if you want to call that good, that's totally cool with that. So we failed to... Shine forth the image of God. We failed to reflect the holiness of God. We broke our mirror. And we know that God doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. And now I'll bring you to Auburn. Because in my senior year, my annoying roommate that spent his three years praying for me while I was playing finally talked me into going to a Bible study. And I was like, whatever. So I went to a Bible study, and this is written up on the wall. And I'm so uncomfortable, like some of you guys are. I'm like, dude, whatever, just get me out of here. What do we got to do to get out of here? And I just started staring at the wall. The dude talked for an hour. But I never heard a word he said. Because I knew how I was living in college. I was having fun. But the more I saw that, the more my heart began to break. And I understood that I was oh so guilty. And I also understood that the wages of my sin was death. That as of right now, in the state that I was in in my senior year, if I had stood before God, He would have condemned me as guilty. And I kept reading the second part, but the free gift, and I thought... I grew up in church. I went every Sunday morning. Whatever. I know about the Jesus deal, but it was different for me that day. I understood that all of my guilt had been removed through what he did on the cross. I understood that when he died, he died in my place. 
and therefore all my stupidity and all my ignorance and all my fun and all that junk was paid for. And it was removed. And my mirror wasn't broken anymore. And now, through the work of Christ, I could shine forth the image and the glory of God. So I want to bring you to this man. And you remember, I told you that God was uniquely involved in two. He was uniquely involved in Adam because he was made from dirt, right? He was uniquely involved in Christ, too, because he was born of a virgin. There wasn't a man involved. God made the second man, and this man was a God-man. He was fully God and fully man. And where Adam failed and broke his mirror and could not bear the image of God, this man, let me tell you something, he never broke his mirror. He fully fulfilled the image and the glory of God. He was 100% obedient and he was 100% dependent on his father in everything that he did. And yet he, in our place, took on our sins. Remember all this stuff? You were dead in your trespasses and sin. You were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. Well, the very next passage says this. But God. Now let me tell you something. Those are the best two words in the Bible. Because if you don't have those two words, you stand before God guilty with a broken mirror. But God being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. 1 Peter puts it this way, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now, you see that live to righteousness? Let me talk about that for just a second and I'm really getting close to being done. I'm not knocking this, please. I'm not. But I did the little vac vacation Bible school thing and raised my hand when I was young. Okay? I walked the aisle when I was a teenager. I lost a basketball game and got saved again. I went through this like 12 times. But that day in Auburn, something extraordinary happened, and I don't really have the words for it. I just know that God dealt with me, and that's the only way I know how to tell you that. I just know that for the wages of sin is death, began to wreck and ruin my life. And I left from there, and the next time I tried to party and have a good time, I went home in my apartment, and I got on my knees, and I began crying, and I screamed at God, and I said, what's wrong with me? This used to be fun. He said, oh, it's not going to be fun anymore. I'd never experienced that. I thought, what's the deal, man? I got saved when I was a kid. I did that thing. Whatever the preacher told me to do, I did. But what happened to me at Auburn changed the way that I viewed sin, and I began to view sin the way God viewed sin, and I began to hate it. And it didn't happen like that, but it began to happen in a progressive way. Things in my life began to fall away. I would do this, and I would despise it. I would do this, and I would despise it, and I seriously doubt y'all have ever done anything that I didn't do. But after that moment, I never enjoyed it again. I began to hate it. Because I understood that when he died for me, he began to live in me and change the way that I think. You know, I moved to Portland for two years, and I love going to Portland because I could walk up to a person and say, hey, you know Jesus? And they go, who are you talking about? And I'm like, this is awesome. I said, you ever been in a church? He said, I don't even know what, I don't know what you're talking about, dude. I do that on the mountain, and everybody you talk to knows Jesus on Sand Mountain. It's incredible. We have like a 99.999% salvation rate on Sand Mountain. It's remarkable. The problem is a lot are still loving sin. And that's confusing to me because Scripture says that's not possible. Things begin to change. 
One other verse is one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, He, God the Father, made Him, Christ the Son, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Here we go again. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. In other words, after what took place at Auburn, like I said earlier, my broken mirror got fixed. And I began slowly, slowly to look a lot more like Christ. Y'all, I remember so many moments in college, and I don't want to glorify sin. One of my biggest things was anger. I was such an angry person, it was bizarre. I remember sitting in somebody's car. They had a really cool Camaro, and I just, I made the lowest in all of pharmacy school. They post your grades by social security number. So I'm going down through the list, and I'm getting worried and getting worried and getting worried, and I get to the bottom of every student, and there's my social security number. I was so angry. I got in their Camaro, and I stuck my fist through their dash. Never got a ride with them again, but that's who I was. And after Auburn, I'm working at my first job, and I had been working with this young lady as my technician, pharmacy technician, for over a year. And something happened in the pharmacy that made her mad. And she said, and I said, you know, that really irritates me. That almost makes me mad. And she laughed at me. She said, like you could ever get mad. And I began to cry. She said, what's wrong with you? I said, you don't know who I used to be. You don't know what the Lord's done to me. And things continued to grow. But that verse. Now, I don't know where y'all are. I have no idea. But I do know that you're at a crossroads. And I do pray that one day the Lord will deal with you. Not that you'll do what some pastor told you to do, that the Lord will deal with you. And I pray that the day he does, you will repent and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did because he did it on your behalf so that you could reflect the glory of the Father. Let's pray. Father, how I praise your name. And I know there are many in this room that could testify to a story very similar as mine, and I'm very thankful for that. In fact, some of these young people here that are adults could probably testify to a story similar to that. But Lord, I'm going to pray for what I know you're going to do. I pray that you'll be faithful, like you never have actually not been. And I pray that you would interrupt their lives. I pray that one day you would come crashing in and they would understand their sin and they would understand the beauty of Jesus and they would understand that you are alone, the only God to reveal himself and they would understand that you made your son to be sin in their place and they would trust you in faith. God, they've all been created in your image. I pray that you would restore that image and give them a new mirror so they could shine with it, with the glory in which they've been created. God, may your hand of blessing be upon their lives. May everything they touch succeed. But most importantly, may you lead them to yourself. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name.